Chapter Fifteen of The Secret of the Silver Car by Wyndham Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Fifteen. Anthony the Triumphant. The butler tapped upon Trent's door before nine next morning. I've just taken a telephone message for you, Mr. Anthony. Very important, if I may judge. Come in and tell me about it, the American said. He could not imagine who knew his whereabouts. It must be Maitland, he supposed, who had promised to see him before he joined his destroyer again, if it were possible. "'It's from the American Embassy,' the butler informed him. "'What?' Trent demanded. "'Are you sure?' "'The American Embassy? What had he to do with that?' Once behind the doors, he was on American soil and subject to her jurisdiction." was a message saying that the ambassador must see you at once. I took the liberty of saying I thought you could get there by half-past nine. A motor will be waiting when you have dressed." Anthony Trent sat on the edge of his bed and saw all his high hopes dashed to earth. Someone must have told the ambassador of this young fellow-countryman of his who was on intimate terms with the cabinet minister, and the ambassador, with the aid of his intelligence department, must have run him to earth. For a moment he wondered whether it would not be wiser to make a run for it. Maitland, now assured of his bona fides, would not hesitate to take him with him and land him at some lonely spot on the Italian coast by night. He had money and his wits. It would be beginning life over again, but it would be better than disgrace here in London. Then his fighting side asserted itself. He would not be frightened into flight before he was convinced flight was necessary. There was another visitor in the American ambassador's waiting room, a man of middle age who smoked an excellent cigar. He turned as Trent entered. Morning, said Trent morosely. He was annoyed to find that he had to speak. It was the publisher of a chain of magazines for one of which Trent used to write when engaged in the manufacture of light fiction. He had often smoked one of the millionaire's celebrated cigars. "'Good morning,' said the publisher graciously. "'It's a long time since I saw you.' "'The ambassador keeps extraordinary hours,' Trent commented. "'He's a businessman,' the other explained. "'Not bred to the old-time diplomacy, just a plain businessman. "'What have you done that he sent for you?' "'You don't seem to understand,' the publisher said mildly. "'I only understand,' Trent said, still irritably, "'that I'm being kept waiting. "'He was to see me at nine-thirty, "'and it's now twenty minutes to breakfast.' "'He was on the minute,' the other laughed. "'Where have you been, not to know I'm the ambassador?' "'You?' said Trent in amazement. "'That I'm making a damned good one,' the diplomat said, "'even if I do get up hours before the rest of them.' "'What am I here for?' Trent demanded. "'Congratulations, mainly,' said the ambassador. "'I was waked out of sleep at after midnight by the Prime Minister. He wanted to know if I'd heard of an American called Anthony Trent. I said, "'Sure, he used to write for me. Anthony Trent is all right. The way these Londoners keep up half the night is something shocking.' "'I still don't see why you've sent for me, Mr. Hill.' "'I'll explain,' said the ambassador. His manner was serious so serious indeed that anthony trent was infinitely perturbed you may not know it but you've rendered your country a considerable service over here in the birthday or new year honours list you'll find decorations awarded men the public knows nothing about trent sometimes they're given for work like you have done we don't give orders or decorations or grants of money if we did you'd have one coming to you what you've done won't even come before Congress. You'll be a mute, inglorious Milton, but if the day comes when you need help, if you should ever be in a tight place, remember you've got something to trade with. I'm not going to mention this again, but you bear it in mind. I certainly will, Trent said gratefully. Then he spoke a little hesitatingly. Be frank with me, Mr. Hill. I ask this as a personal favour. Had you anything at the back of your mind when you spoke about my being in a tight place or needing help? 
No, the ambassador said, after a mental reaction which could be measured in seconds. But you've made enemies here. Some of them have sent in asking what you do for your livelihood. Of course, I remembered that Australian uncle. He certainly must have cut up rich. He did, Anthony Trent said somberly. He had invented an Australian uncle years before to account for possession of the large sums of money his professional work netted him. Oddly enough, the memory gave him little pleasure now. I was able to assure the inquisitive, the diplomat declared, that I had known you for years. Enemies. Castoon, perhaps, who hated him on sight, and possibly the Colonel Langley, who was now his friend. What others unknown to him might there not be? And there was Lady Paul Ruin, sister of Willoughby Maitland. She probably would be influenced by her favourite brother, and receive him on a friendly footing if they met again. These people he knew, but it was the unknowns who bothered him. Was Rudolf Castoon one of them? he inquired. The Chancellor of the Exchequer? Hill laughed. My boy, you've certainly got right into the top hole set here. The inquisitive ones were your own country folk, who were jealous that a man not even the social register got in on intimate terms with the great families. Maybe they wanted to get your formula. Nothing serious. I've got a busy morning. Lunch with me at one tomorrow? Gladly, Anthony Trent returned, his manner brighter. Never had he shaken hands so heartily with his old publisher. It's done me good to see you, he exclaimed. The friendly butler informed Trent in confidence that Lady Daphne was not yet down. His lordship was already riding in the row. Her ladyship has not been informed of your arrival, said the butler. She is expected down in a few minutes. I've ordered kidneys and bacon en brochette for you, sir. This feels like being really at home, the American said. I've wanted that for breakfast every morning I've been away, and never once had the luck to get it. Below stairs the butler informed the housekeeper, who later retailed it to the maids, that Mr. Anthony seemed very nervous. A footman openly rejoiced when he overheard the butler's conversation with the housekeeper that his duties would enable him to witness the meeting of his mistress and the American. "'There will be nobody in the breakfast-room when the ladyship enters but Mr. Anthony,' his superior said firmly. "'Haven't you got any romance in you, Simpkins?' "'Yes,' answered the footman simply. That's why I want to see them. Anthony Trent was sitting in a big winged chair by the fire when Daphne entered. She walked to the table and picked up some letters without seeing him. At every mail she expected to hear from him, and now was another of these continual disappointments. Invitations, letters from friends and relatives, but never a one from the man she loved. Watching her, Anthony Trent was a victim to many emotions. The rumour which he had confidently disputed that she was engaged to Rudolf Castoon now assumed a guise of probability. Why not? He had left her expecting never to see her again. He had convinced her of the insurmountable barrier between them, a barrier which still existed. What a fool he had been to twist the Earl's statement about Arthur into something that spelled hope when none was intended. That he was here was due to the feeling on Lord Rosecarrel's part that he deserved courtesy at the hands of the Granvilles. Before leaving for Croatia, he had assured the elder man that he would not claim a reward. And here he was, within a few feet of Daphne. What he should have done was to call and greet her in a friendly fashion, a fashion which would have told her that he realized there could no longer be any pretense of intimacy between them. Instead, he was hiding in a deep chair, and must presently disclose himself. He noted anxiously that she was looking frail and tired. There was a sadness on her face which he had not seen there before. It was, he decided, a hopelessness, a lack of the vivacity which had always distinguished her. It was when the butler had decided time enough had elapsed for greeting that Simpkins was allowed to bear in silver dishes of food, it was the footman's entrance which made the girl look up from her unopened collection of letters. She did not see Simpkins. She saw only the man in the chair, the tall, slim man who rose almost awkwardly 
when he met her wide open eyes. Ordinarily self-possessed, never at a loss for a word or embarrassed, Anthony Trent stood there dumb and looked at her. Oh, Tony, Tony, she cried. Immensely gratified, Simpkins beheld the American gather her to him. Honest Simpkins had tears in his eyes. He went from the room blindly, his mission unaccomplished. He had seen love so near to him that he was dazzled. It was in Daphne's own sitting-room facing St. James Park that they were able to talk coherently. "'Why do you suddenly look so grave on this morning of all mornings in my life?' she asked tenderly. "'Darling,' he said, "'I can't keep on living in this doubt any longer. "'You know what I said in Cornwall.' "'That's so long ago. "'I forget. "'Exactly what did my wise Tony say? "'I only remember that he said he loved me.' "'I shall always say that,' he said softly. "'Daphne, I must not go on deluding myself any longer.' I ought not to have seen you. It was only because your father was courteous, and I was weak, that I came. You have seen father, she cried. Last night, he told her. I was with him for an hour. He was very kind. Did he tell you about Arthur? He said he was going to be married. She looked at her Tony with a smile he could not understand. There was certainty in it, content assurance. It was as though there were no barriers that kept him from her. "'My wise Tony,' she said, "'there is much for you to learn. Let us leave Grossman Place and go to Australia in the first place.' "'Australia?' he cried uneasily. For the second time within a few hours the island continent had arisen to confound him. "'Yes, Australia,' she said. "'You remember that my father bought a place there for Arthur?' He had often heard of it. It was a magnificent property of a hundred thousand acres. Great flocks of sheep and cattle grazed on it, and there were hundreds of horses. There were lakes on it where the rainbow trout grew to fifteen pounds in weight. He had seen photographs of the big house with its tennis courts, its outside swimming pool, its walled gardens. It was administered, he knew, by intelligent superintendents and capable of even greater development. A wonderful place, he said. Yes, I remember. Your father wanted to sell it. He has given it away instead. Given away a place like that? Perhaps I ought not to say given away, she smiled. He has given it in exchange for what business people call collateral. He has given it to you, Tony, subject to certain conditions. Me? he cried. Oh, no! Impossible! I couldn't take it! But you haven't even heard the conditions, she said. I go with it. It must be kept in the family. Anthony Trent had a vision of the future. He saw himself a clean man again, a man with hard work before him and great responsibilities. He remembered his country's ambassador and the cryptic utterances which might mean so much. The new life in a new country where none knew him. The realization of those dreams of children who need never be ashamed of their parentage. And all this was offered him. Daphne, looking at him, saw that the eyes which she had sometimes thought were hard were softened now. None but she had ever seen tears in the eyes of Anthony Trent, who had once been the master criminal. Oh, Daphne, he said brokenly. Daphne. The End End of The Secret of the Silver Car by Wyndham Martin Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon Nijmegen, The Netherlands, 2014